Yeah, so um, welcome back, everyone. Um, we just went on a quick break because we had to get our speakers back here. But you'd agree with me that since the beginning of today's section, we've had really exciting topics from introductory down to um, the expert level. And then we're back to um, understanding the basics of um, understanding the basics of um, controllers and introduction to custom resources, which is going to be our next section. So buckle up everyone as we get our speaker on here. So the next section is going to be focused on extending Kubernetes and um, introducing custom resources, controllers, and operators. And this is going to be taken by Oladipo Ajayi, who is a cloud native engineer currently at Container Solution, helping with businesses, helping businesses with cloud native transformation from beginning to the end and everything in between. And uh, it's good to have you here, Dipo. Thank you very much. Good to be here also. Awesome. All right. Um, yeah, sorry for the delay. I think I have. I'll have more time to myself, Anita, right? Since I'm starting early. Yes. <laughs> yes, it appears so. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Um, hello everyone. My name is Dipo Ajayi. Um, I'll be speaking on extending Kubernetes, um, introducing custom resources, custom controllers, operators, and schedulers. And if there is time, I'll be able to do a simple demo um, while we're at it. Um, yeah, so for, like I said, my name is Dick Paul. I'm a cloud data engineer at Container Solutions. Um, I'm a cloud architect, cloud engineer, um, DevOps engineer, and everything on AWS and Azure. Um, also a software engineer when I can. Um, I basically write Python and Golang, um, building, for now, majorly focusing on building controllers and operators. Um, yeah, nice to meet you. So let's 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 get to let's get to going. Um, so yeah, what is Kubernetes? Um, I I don't want to focus so much on what Kubernetes is and um, its definition, but I'm going to mention just a couple of things. Um, first off, um, Kubernetes, like we know, is a container orchestration tool. Um, it helps uh, orchestrate containers, manages them, and their entire life cycle pretty much. Like that's a very simple definition of what Kubernetes is. Um, like I said, the, some of the features are it autonomous deployments, helps with auto scaling, um, helps with self healing. So, for example, if your pod is down, it can only spin it up by itself. And it also helps with secret management and configuration management and so many things. Um, but these are the basic things Kubernetes do. Um, wait, yeah, we are missing something. And what's that? Um, yeah, Kubernetes is highly extensible. Yeah, that's right. So you can always add your new features. You can add whatever you need to do. And that is one of the key things that uh, people don't talk about, about Kubernetes for. Yeah, like I mentioned, all of those things that I mentioned or I listed earlier are really awesome. But Kubernetes being a very um, highly extensible system, and what I mean is that you can add your own features. And if you go to Kubernetes GitHub repository, because it's open source, there are no, there are really no uh, um, patches, right? No request to add like basic major features, right? So if I, as a company, I need a particular feature, right, on Kubernetes and it's not available in the default installation, I can always add it myself because of this extensibility. And um, what actually makes this happen, uh, what makes this high extensibility happen is because the all of Kubernetes is built on APIs. So everything you're seeing from your port, your services, and everything are APIs. So everything is communicating with API. You're communicating with Kubernetes through the API. You're doing Kubernetes communicating with itself through the Kubernetes API. And that's one of the real beauties of Kubernetes that is not being spoken so much about. So um, yeah, extending Kubernetes. What does what do I mean when I say extending Kubernetes? Um, Majorly, what it means is that you're adding a new functionality, like I mentioned earlier. Um, 
that isn't part of your default Kubernetes installation. So if I have, if I decide to install maybe Kubernetes 1.22, for example, 1.21, um, there are a set of features that comes with it. Um, but then there are times when what you need, what you actually need is not included in this particular, um, in the default installation. And you can also always add something to it. So yeah, um, that's what extending Kubernetes mean here. Yeah? Um, there are several ways Kubernetes can be extended, like a lot of ways. But for this talk, we'll be focusing majorly on um, including endpoints and adding functionality to the Kubernetes API. Um, I'll explain what this means as I go on and to become clear as I, as I move on, but majorly focusing on creating endpoints and adding functionality to the endpoints, pretty much very, um, very simple. So let's take it back. Let's take a step back and see. We've already defined what um, Kubernetes is, right? Um, but then let's look at something. Um, I'm sure a couple of us will be familiar with this image. So this image is the Kubernetes cluster and the components that make up a Kubernetes cluster. Now, what we're seeing here is we have the control node or control plane, which is the left-hand side. Everything within that blue dotted line is the control plane. And all of those things are things that come packaged with every Kubernetes installation. Um, so we have our controller manager here. Uh, we have our etcd. So etcd is more like a storage um, that stores a key value pair of all of the resources, all of the um, resources within Kubernetes. So your pods, your services, your deployments, all the information that Kubernetes need, need to know to keep state of that resource is stored in etcd. And then we have the scheduler. The scheduler basically is what the scheduler does is it schedules pods to nodes simple. And then we have um, our cloud controller manager, which is majorly for cloud providers. So for example, we're, we're looking at um, AKS um, in AWS or AKS in Azure or GK in Google. They all have this feature whereby it makes it easy for them to be able to connect to the baseline infrastructure. So it's not, it's not, it's not a, it's not part, it's not a, uh, a major part of the Kubernetes cluster, but majorly for cloud providers, people that need it, like I mentioned earlier. And then we have our worker nodes here. And those worker nodes majorly connect to the cluster through kubectl and kubeproxy. So pretty much this is what you have for every default installation. And this, as you can see, the API sits at the center of everything. Um, and the reason is because that is more like, like the ad bit of the cluster itself every communication that happens within the Kubernetes cluster from outside the Kubernetes cluster into the cluster. For example, as a user, I'm using kubectl. Um, everything goes to the Kube, um, API server. And the API server itself, it's what um, exposes the Kubernetes API that we've been talking about um, since, I, since I began the talk. So yes, what is this? What is the um, Kubernetes API? Um, yeah, it's a set of HTTP endpoints, like I mentioned, um, majorly exposed by um, the API server in the control node or the control plane, um, like I mentioned earlier. And it sounds like an entry point in which users or entities can enter to the cluster. So users by like um, the DevOps engineer, a cloud engineer, or a software engineer, or entities like services within the cluster, or maybe a, a EC2 instance, for example, just an example that needs to communicate with the cluster. Um, all of this thing happens through the API server. And this API server, API actually coordinates how all the resources or objects are accessed within the cluster. Um, now, as you can see in the diagram below, we can see this is very similar to the image that we had initially, but then there's, there's um, a an attachment to the right hand side. And that attachment is more or less like showing how the HTTP endpoints actually looks like. So we have some set of endpoints like the else, the metrics. So things like these are like common to applications where you can check the else and then get logs and metrics from the cluster. And then for very specific things, like for example, pods, or oh, I want to get a list of my pods now, for example, in my cluster, the endpoint I will go to majorly is the API, forward slash API, forward slash version one, 
first slash ports, and I can use um, my HTTP verbs, my get, my list, my create, my update, and all of this. And then those are the things. This this majorly is very familiar with us, right? Um, for especially for software engineers that are used to creating APIs and endpoint and all of that. So this is what is going on in the background. That's it. That's we are not seeing. Like a typical Kubernetes user is not seeing. Um, so yeah, here we have it. So this is an example of the Kubernetes API. Now down to what we actually want to talk about today. Um, talk about resources. Uh, very, 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 very. Um, like we said, there's this thing. Or is actually true that the pod is like this. The it's the simplest unit, right? Within a cluster, within a Kubernetes cluster, right? But that pod itself is actually a resource. And like I mentioned, all resources in Kubernetes are endpoints. So when you, when you think about your node, node resource, you think about your pod resource, you think about your service resource, you think about your namespace, you think about your volume, and so many other things, your job, your current jobs, anything you can think of, they are all endpoints, like I've mentioned. And I try to, I, I try to build them here. Yeah? Um, but now, that's what is there. Now, to be looking at the right-hand side of, of the slide right now, we would see there is a point where we have a Kubernetes object and something that isn't a Kubernetes object. Like I mentioned, everything is a, is a resource, is a Kubernetes resource, um, but not everything is a, is a Kubernetes object. Um, and the difference majorly is objects are usually like persistent entities. So for example, I, I create a resource type. I have a resource type, which is namespace uh, pods, right? And then I create a, a resource instance with my YAML file. I do kubectl apply, and I create a pod, right? That creating a pod is a resource instance. But what comes out of it, right? That pod instance that has this entire metadata and the ID and everything being persisted in etcd is the Kubernetes object itself. So in comparison to when you do like a kubectl API resources command, for example, um, this, what this does is it lists a set of resources for us, right? It's a resource instance, but not an object. And the reason it's not an object is because it's not being persisted in the uh, etcd, in the cluster. So it's just doing something, but it's not actually an entity that's doing something that needs to be monitored or controlled, um, or we will go back to when we need them. So that's a major difference between a Kubernetes object and instances, resource instances that are not objects. Um, now that we have an idea of what a Kubernetes resource is, um, what do we mean when we say, what is a custom resource? Because that is what this talk is about. How do we extend um, Kubernetes to be able to create custom resources? So what are custom resources? Custom resources majorly are endpoints, like we've mentioned in the Kubernetes API that allow the creation of custom objects like I explained initially, of a particular resource type. So in the previous slide, we saw how we created a Kubernetes object, a Kubernetes pod object, right, with a resource type of pod. So we can do the same thing for our custom resources and say, OK, I want to create a custom resource called full, full bar, something. And I want you to be able to create a Kubernetes object of, of, my, of type uh, full bar, for example. And how do we do that? How do we say, okay, how do I add this full bar resource right, to my endpoints, my Kubernetes endpoints? And the way we do that is we do, we use a Kubernetes, a custom resource definition. So um, a custom resource definition majorly is like a, like, like a template. Um, and what that template does is it's used to add endpoints to our resource to our Kubernetes API. And that's, that is what it does. It had endpoint and it had fields and metadata that can be filled into that um, resource endpoint. So for example, the image that we have here, we have a YAML file, which is the custom resource definition. It creates a custom resource as an endpoint. That's what you have in the middle. And anytime we call that endpoint, we can use that endpoint, which is a resource now, custom resource now. We can use it to create a lot of objects, a collection of Kubernetes API objects of that custom resource type. So uh, I'll take it again. Uh, we will, I would create a custom resource of a particular um, resource type. Let's say full bar, like I said earlier, 
through the custom resource definition. Now, if I want to create a, an object of that resource type, I would have to query the custom resource endpoint to be able to have to be able to create that object and to be able to query it, list it, get it, delete it, just the same way an API would work normally. Um, yeah, so for for this, for this, this is what we have for custom resources. But then they really don't do anything. Custom resources are just um, they are just labels or let me say like string, for example. You know, when you do maybe A in your in the programming, when you do A equals to um, quotation mark A B C D, that doesn't do anything. It's just a placeholder, right? So custom resources are like placeholder. They don't do anything. Um, they don't have any power of their own. They don't. They cannot think by themselves. More like a caricature. In, uh, if I can use that term. Um, but what actually makes them do something? Like, for example, our pod now, we know that our pod um, object takes an image, right? Runs that image and then exposes an, a pod and then an endpoint that we can access the application that is running within that pod, right? What makes that possible? Um, and what makes that possible are controllers. Like I mentioned before, when we we're looking at the things that were in the control plane, uh, right? We talked about the controller manager. So the controller manager contains all the logic that all the resources are using, all the default resources. So by default resources, I mean pods, namespace, nodes, daemon sets, deployment, stateful sets. How are they reconciled? What did they do? So controllers actually do that for us. So controllers are like uh are control loops that track a Kubernetes API type to make sure that that current state matches the desired state. So one thing I need to mention before we continue is that um, Kubernetes was built on an event-driven architecture. And what, what that means is that um, a controller, or Kubernetes watches for changes to a particular event and then triggers the necessary, um, the necessary things that it needs to do based on that event. So for example, if I do a create event now, if I do kubectl create or kubectl apply, and then I pass in a file, a pod file, I'm, passing, I'm sending in an event to the Kubernetes cluster. It picks that up, looks at my file, gets the, um, gets the resource kind, and then passes it to the right controller. And the controller knows what to do by creating whatever it needs to do. So for our, our pod example, it looks, it says, oh, this is a pod kind or pod resource type. And what it does is it takes this, this schema, the name, the namespace, the um, container image, the container name, the container port, for example, and does something with it. And what we have is we have a container, a Docker container, right, running, and then we can access it with the necessary metadata that was passed in into our pod YAML file. So that's how it works. So for controllers, is what a controller is that black box you are not seeing, right? Um, when we when we do kubectl apply or kubectl get or kubectl describe, right? All of those things are part of the controller, and the controller actually maintains that for us. So controllers will look at our desired state. So our desired state is what we send into Kubernetes, and the actual state is what is actually happening within. Kubernetes. So for example, if I send in a deployment now, a deployment type, and I specify I want to have three or three instances of a particular image running, right? So that's my desired state, right? Um, by the time I send it in, um, it starts with zero, and then it increases to one, two, and three, and then it stops. If any of the ports is deleted, or maybe it's down for whatever reason, the actual state and desired state are no longer in sync. So if the controller, what the controller does is it makes sure that um, it returns the um, actual state of the of that particular resource into the desired state. So it do, continues doing that in a, in a loop. But then instead of doing a loop and trying to make sure um, make sure that everything works, it can overwhelm the system. So that's why they opted in for an event driven architecture. And by when there is a change. There's an event is sent, and then the controller can take care of whatever is happening um, there. So yeah, we've talked about controllers. Now, custom controllers, um, which is what we want to talk about, right? Um, custom, custom resources, like I mentioned, are just endpoints created by custom resource definition. So they're just like an API that can query object, 
uh, within them. They don't do anything more than that. Um, custom controllers like are the log logic that bring those custom resources or the object they create to life. Like they become responsive. That's what I mean. And um, like I mentioned, Kubernetes uses a declarative programming model, which means that you only dictate the viral state of the object you want to achieve. That is all you do. You don't care about what is happening in the background. All you know that I have declared this and I expect Kubernetes to give me what I've declared, right? And because Kubernetes um, custom controllers extend the functionality of the Kubernetes API on built-in resources, right? So um, I have a pod now, for example, but I want to do more on it, or I want to change the, beha the way the pods behave. The way I do that is I create a controller that handles that logic for me, right? And that's what controllers do. Um, they, usually, they, usually, they are used typically when a use case is not covered by the built-in controller manager for a beauty resource type. So very important for us to make to note there is that they, they are used for use cases that are not covered by the built-in controller manager in our control plane for built-in resource type. By built-in resource types, the things I mean are things like pods, um, namespaces, uh, deployments, and so on. So like a typical example of when we want to use a custom controller is let's say that we have an application that uses a config map right, to maybe send some environment variables into the containers that we are creating. Um, so, uh, but then there's always the possibility that those values can change. A typical manual process will have been, if I need to make an update to my config map, right, I make the update to the config map with the key and value. And, but then what happens is that the pod that are running on that config map don't change because the values are being passed at runtime. Now, for me to be able to make sure that the pods have this, the necessary things, I would have to go and stop the pod and then restart it, right? So that's the manual process that we need to do. Now we can create a controller that watches for the config map um, resource type and watches for changes to the config map values. When a controller detects a change to the value, it automatically restarts the pod for us. So that is one of the beauty of controllers. And that's why it has gained too much traction over the last three, four years, because it's actually very, very, um, very reliable and it's very useful for some peculiar use cases like this one that we mentioned. So that's what con um, custom controllers are. Yeah, in summary, custom controllers are written by you and work with built-in resources. So deployment, replica sets, and so on. And um, and custom resources, they don't exist in the Cube Controller Manager. So what I mean is, like I mentioned, the Cube Controller Manager only contains controllers for um, default resource types, right? Um, but then these controllers do not live in there. What that means is that, um, and they are independent of the cycles life cycle. What that means is that I can deploy my controller somewhere else, and it's to still be watching for changes to my Kubernetes cluster. So for example, if I delete, I, if a entire cluster goes down, for example, um, the controller will still be running. It might not just receive any event. And when you create your cluster again, you continue working. So it doesn't have to be deployed on a Kubernetes cluster. That's what this means. That's what this sentence means. Uh, we can always separate it like a separate application that is living on its own. Yeah, so operators. Um, yeah, so this is the next step to controllers and what they do. Um, so operators majorly are built on top of the Kubernetes ab abstraction um, to automate the entire life cycle of the application in Manage. So for example, uh, we have Kubernetes resources, um, the, like I've mentioned, controllers concept for building resources, like for a specific use case. Now, um, controllers are usually used for building resources, right? Um, but operators majorly focus on custom objects and custom resources. So like you mentioned, we have custom resources, right? We have custom objects that are created. The custom resources being created by the custom resource definition. Now, when we, when we take it a step back and we say, okay, yes, controllers create, controllers control the life cycle of building resources. What about the uh, our own native custom resource types that we created and the objects we create through those resource types? Up, that's where operators come in. So that is what they do. Um, they they are custom controllers, right? 
they, they are pretty much almost the same thing, but they track and manage custom objects created by custom resource definitions. Um, operators are quite powerful in their use cases. And um, they also help to automate the operations of your Kubernetes application, like more like an SRE tool and a software administrator for a Kubernetes software application. Like the example I gave earlier, a, an SRE engineer will have needed to go and stop that board and restart it, right? But your controller or your operator will be able to do that for you automatically without you bothering or wondering about what's going on. So yeah, so this is the beauty of operators and why they are important, right? And why a lot of people have been getting on it. Um, it's, it's still growing, it's still, a very good, it's still a growing community because it takes a lot of time to build an end-to-end -end operator. Um, for the major operators that we have now, they're usually for major companies that are cloud native, for maybe, for example, databases now for, let's say, um, um, Postgres and the rest. They probably are the ones using operators because it's quite um, developer um, intensive and time intensive to build and to build the entire end-to-end -end process. But either way, we can always still build our own mini mini operators for the things that we need to do. Um, yeah, so for the last piece here, which is the cost schedulers I mentioned, um, schedulers majorly or basically ensure that ports are assigned to the best possible available nodes. That's what they do. Like they don't do any other thing. They are not complex. That is it. That is the definition. Um, yeah, like I said, um, Inbuilt, there's an inbuilt scheduler called the script scheduler, which handles like most of the scenarios that we would need schedulers for, like most of the scenarios we need schedulers for. But there are times where there are use cases whereby um, the, the queue scheduler will not be able to handle. And that's when we can, we need probably need to write our own scheduler and attach it to um, our Kubernetes cluster so that we can use that scheduler instead of the um, default cube scheduler. So a typical example is maybe, for example, I have a deployment or a stateful set, right? And I want to, I want to be able to order um, outputs are uh, deployed across multiple zones. So let's assume I have a Kubernetes cluster, right? And I have multiple nodes, let me say like 10 or 15 availability zones um, across multiple places. Um, and I have worker nodes in all of those um, zones. What um, a scheduler you can write a scheduler that says, okay, this is the order in which I want this node, this pods to be deployed to this node. So I can say, oh, we need to go to availability zone A first, then go to availability zone Z, create the pod there, then come back to B and go to E and come back to F. So that is a typical example of what a custom scheduler does. Um, yeah, so. That's what it does. Um, the use cases for this one are usually not as much or as visible as that of controllers or operators, but then they can also be useful. Um, yeah, so in, in foresight or in hindsight, we have, when it is really has become like a major tool in the Kubernetes space, right? Um, when you say, and a lot of people would say, when you say Kubernetes, you mean cloud native, right? So cloud native is like equals equals to cloud uh, Kubernetes and the other way around because of its use of use and ability to scale workloads effectively with its wide range of use cases by its robust API. So as the adoption of Kubernetes actually increases, there'll be scenarios Kubernetes is not equipped to handle by default, but then that's where extensibility comes into play. And we can also always extend it any way we want in whatever fashion that we want to extend it. Um, I'll do a quick demo on custom resources, custom resource definition and controllers. Basically, before I go, um, let me share the right screen. All right, so um, what I'm going to do here, uh, I hope you can, I hope it's clear enough. Um, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to show us how custom resource is created through custom resource definitions, and we'll see how a controller is being used. So this um, controller here is pretty much basic and simple. And what it does is it creates an Nginx image without us specifying the Nginx image. And so it's just very basic here to just show us how controllers actually work. 
Um, now, for like I mentioned, there are a lot of custom resource types that we have um, in, a, in a default Kubernetes cluster. So um, let me show you a couple. So we can see a lot. I know that we'll be able to recognize some of the some of these things. There. You can see you nodes, you can see pods, you can see secret service account, and so on. These are the default values for this default resource types for um, um, Kubernetes uh, in Kubernetes, right? And now we want to create a new resource type called Nginx operator. And um, so let's do something real quick. Let's see if we can find it within our resource type at the moment. So you can see that there's nothing like that because you didn't return anything. Um, one thing we can do, like I mentioned, for a custom resource, uh, custom resource, so what we need now is we need the custom resource definitions, right? And that custom resource definition, let me look for it. Um, Yes, so this is a typical example of what we would have in a custom resource definition. So you can see it's a, and again, custom resource definition is actually a custom resource type also, which is, which is, which is, which is, which is but that's what makes it really beautiful. So you're using an API endpoint to create other API endpoints, right? So you can see it has a kind of custom resource definition. It has the name. So this is going to be the, the name of our um, custom resource type. And um, you can see that a couple of things that have been mentioned, the group it, it belongs to, the plural form, which is NNS operator, singular form, NGNX operator, and we are specifying that is a namespace uh, resource type. There are two types of resource types. There's names, uh, namespace and cluster-wide. So cluster-wide are operators that you don't need to specify your, your namespace to be able to access them. Um, but, uh, but for namespace operator, you need to uh, specify the namespace it, it's in or it's being the default um, namespace or the whatever default namespace we specify on our Kubernetes cluster. And it shows the version and so many other things. So there's a lot of things going on here. So uh, let me just mention one thing here. We can see the spec and show if you've, if you've played a lot with um, um, YAML files, Kubernetes YAML files will be, will be familiar with what the spec is, right? So you can see a spec is asking for things like uh, ports, um, which is the port of the of the Nginx operator and the replica, the number of replicas you want to have to uh, in order to scale, just like a deployment, right? So this is what it does. Um, a, what in, a, what, a, it's something to note is the status, status um, sub resource. It shows us, so for example, if I have, uh, if I say I want to have three replicas, for example, and I only have one, right? It's going to be, so this is, the status pretty much is where the actual state of that resource type is recorded. So if it's not um, aligning with the desired state, then the controller will be um, activated. So this is what it does. As you can see, we can't find anything that has to do with Nginx controller, Nginx, um, custom resource here. So I'm going to add it now. So I've created, I've added my custom resource definition. Now, coming back here again, I can, let me do the same command again to check. So as you can see now, and I have an Nginx resource type here um, with everything we need. Now, um, what's the next thing we need to do? So the next thing we need to do now is what? We create our Kubernetes object, right? So yeah, let's 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 go ahead and do that since we already have our custom resource type. Um, come in. So for our Nginx, no, not this one. Uh, yeah, samples. So. Because you can see, we have a kind of Nginx operator here with the name this. I'm saying, let's have two replicas and have a port of port 80. Yeah, all right. So let's do that. Um, kubectl apply dash f um, config samples operator. Yeah, this one. Now, 
what happens is we've created our resource objects. So let's see it. Yeah, yes, we have our object here. And you can see it was created 15 seconds ago. But then, um, this our object is supposed to do what? Uh, this our object is supposed to uh, create two ports, just like deployment work. So let's see if it creates a port for us or not. Um, we can't see any, any port being created. And the reason for this is because we do not have any controller behind it that's listening to activities of this um, resource type to know what to do. So like I said, it's just like a placeholder. Nothing happens. Like I'm not seeing anything, what, nothing is going on. So if I do, for example, QCTL uh, describe um, Nginx operator, you can see at the bottom, you can see there are no events coming in at the bottom. So nothing is going on. We don't know what's going on. Um, so how do we, how do we, how do we, how do we make sure that what we have is actually going, is actually quite, quite fine. Uh, we will need to create a controller and deploy our controller. So for this demo, I'm just going to run it. Like I said, to just show what I have said, I don't need to deploy my controller on Kubernetes. I can just run it as an application. So um, for this one, we are using Go, right, to write our controller. And this is the logic here. This is very simple, very basic. Um, just, this is all you need to run it. Um, a lot of things, I, I, won't, I won't spend time to explain what all of this is doing. But um, what you just need to know is that this is what we need. We are, ma we are, we are, make, we are making use majorly of the deployment resource type to create our pods. So, um, so there's this layer of our Nginx operator custom resource, um, which is built on top of the deployment resource just to be able to create our pod. Um, now, for me to run, let me do this, make, um, I'm waiting for it to start running. So it's running now. It got, as you can see, you know, initially when we did keep saying get port, nothing was running. Now we can see our Nginx operator port actually running now. Um, let's, let's test one more thing to show that it's actually working the way it's supposed to. Let's delete one of these ports. So if I delete one of them, QCTL delete pod. Um, let's just copy this and paste. Waiting for it to return. Yes. So it has deleted one of the pods. Let's see what happens. So what that means is that it's going to change state, right? Our state. So if you do, because this is quite fast, it will probably be done by now. So we won't be able to see it. So we're do, it's already running again 24 seconds ago. So if we have done something like PFCTL, describe Nginx operator. Um, Uh, what's, our, what's the name of our operator again? So at right now, okay, it's not returning any events for now, but then what, what we've done so far is that we can see that when we created our custom resource, right? It created, it, it did our custom resource and we're able to create our objects. But then until we run the controller, none of the things, none of the things, the messages we've sent in was actually implemented. And until we did it. So this is more like a typical example of a use case. Might not be a very good example, but then it's like a early world example of how we can use controllers in our um in our daily activities or in our applications. So yeah, um back to So yeah, um, so what we've covered today has just majorly been um, Kubernetes, custom resources, 
custom resource definitions, um, cu custom controllers, operators, and custom schedulers. Um, yeah, so that's all from me. Thank you very much um, for having me. Oh, thank you so much, Depo Ajay, for that excellent section. And that was a really informative one. If we were able to follow up on the demo, you must have caught up on that as well. Thank you so much for yeah. that section.